Welcome everyone and thank you for virtually joining us for the latest version of the Variant Effects Seminar Series. My name is Diego and I'm a member of the VES Organizing Committee along with Stephen Erwood and Mireya Suma. These seminars are made possible with support and a lot of help from Lara Muffley and Alex Hopkins among several others and our sponsor, the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance. So a big thank you to them. Before jumping in, I have a few housekeeping items to mention. Each talk is about 20 to 25 minutes, so there should be time for questions at the end. Please post those questions at any time, including during the talk, uh, to the Zoom Q&A, and we'll read them out to the speaker at the end. If you have additional questions after the end of the seminar and you're an AVE member, feel free to visit our seminar series Slack channel for more discussion. And finally, we're posting updates on our Twitter account, so be sure to follow us there at Variant Effects. You can catch the seminar today and previous presentations that have been recorded on our affiliate CMAP YouTube channel. Don't worry about trying to copy this whole URL. I'm going to post a link in the chat, or feel free to scan this QR code. We started piloting a new feature where we include a link to these seminars directly in the corresponding BioArchive preprint page. This is handy if you're looking through a preprint and instead of reading, you'd rather just have the author present the highlights of their work. Here's an example from Steven's preprint where you can see that if you click this icon, uh, it pulls up his VES presentation. All the details of the seminar series can be found on our website, including a regularly updated schedule uh, of upcoming speakers. And for the last housekeeping item, this has never been an issue, but as a reminder, uh, please be considerate when posting comments or questions. We expect everyone to be respectful and use welcoming and inclusive language. Without further ado, we have a great speaker scheduled for today's presentation. Matt Coelho is a postdoctoral researcher in the Garnett Laboratory at the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Cambridge. His research is focused on functional gen genomics strategies to understand molecular pathways involved in sensitivity to immunotherapies. The title of Matt's talk is Base Editing Screens, Mutations Affecting Interferon Gamma Signaling in Cancer. And Matt, feel free to start sharing your screen uh, and go ahead and start whenever you are. Okay, thanks very much, Diego. Um, I'll go ahead and share my slides. Okay, okay yeah. Uh, hello everyone. Um, good evening. Well, it's, uh, it's quite late here in the UK, but it's an absolute pleasure to present to you all. Um, really looking forward to the discussion as well. And um, feel free to send me an email um, or on Twitter after, after the presentation if you're watching as a recording. Uh, and as Diego mentioned, actually, I do have a preprint, so you can also find some um, details, further details about this um, and the preprint associated with this paper. So I'm, um, uh, yeah, as, as Diego said, um, this is about base editing mutagenesis. So using um, these base editor CRISPR tools to map function of variants. And we've applied this to the interferon gamma signaling pathway in cancer cells. So why are we interested in looking at um, the interferon gamma signaling pathway and specifically um, working out what the variants do? Well, this is um, a pathway which is mutated in, uh, in several different pathologies in human diseases, such as um, in immunodeficiencies and also in hematological malignancies, such as leukemia. Um, several inflammatory diseases as well associated with um, loss of function and gain of function in, in certain interferon gamma signaling pathway components. <clears throat> so what, what we're really interested in though is actually um, genetic um, variants which cause uh, either increase or decrease in anti-tumor immunity. Okay, so if, if we look at this um, cartoon on the left, um, just to take you through the interferon gamma pathway, um, in a cancer cell, for example, this cytokine binds the receptor and this triggers the JAT stat signaling pathway. So this STAT1, for example, is phosphorylated and shuts the nucleus and causes in the tumor cell, um, cell death or um, cell cycle arrest. 
And these uh, cytokines, for example, are pumped into the tumor microenvironment by anti-tumor T cells or NK cells, for example. Uh, and they're really important, um, not only just for um, immunosurveillance in cancer, but also for therapy. So for um, cancer immunotherapies, for example, with um, immune checkpoint blockade, which many of you might have heard of, is very successful in multiple different cancers. Um, and actually, this is um, partly why we we're interested is the case of resistance to these cancer immunotherapies in the clinic. So these, um, these immune checkpoint blockade antibodies can cause very durable responses in many different types of cancer. So for example, anti-PD-1 antibodies or anti-CTLA-4 antibodies. And for example, in this metastatic melanoma, um, in this patient, it has caused a very good um, response, but um, eventually this patient, unfortunately, has relapsed on therapy. And um, there can be acquired and uh, intrinsic resistance to immunotherapies. And actually some of these are through genetic means, meaning that the tumor itself has mutated. Um, in this case, the interferon gamma pathway. And we can track this in these rare um, case studies where they have pre and post treatment biopsies. There's very strong evidence that um, the interferon gamma pathway mutation, in this case, a loss of function, has led to resistance to therapy. And so, so he, these are some of the genetic causes uh, of, for example, acquired resistance to cancer immunotherapies in the clinic. And um, for example, the JAK-STAT um, pathway is inactivated. So there's interferon gamma in the tumor microenvironment, but these cells are no longer dying, the tumor cells. So part of the issue that we're trying to address here is actually that um, because the loss of function mutations can be in anywhere in the pathway, uh, and often these mutations in cancer are missense variants of unknown clinical significance, um, there's actually a lot of ambiguity in, in inferring what the function of a, many of these missense mutations are. And obviously this is obstructing um, precision medicine and, and the triage of, of patients on therapy uh, and, and challenges. Um, with the resistance to and managing the resistance to these widely used immunotherapies in the clinic. So we think this will be a, um, a, a kind of a, a problem which is actually growing in, in numbers as this is used more commonly and the number of um, tumour biopsies post-treatment expands uh, as time goes on. So Inferring the function of these variants uh, can be done in several ways, such as primary editing, saturation genome editing, uh, and, and in silico approaches. And one approach that we used experimentally here um, is to use cytosine and adenine-based editors. So this is installing a C to T or A to G mutation. And if you, if you perform this uh, analysis, um, as, as saturating as it goes, essentially you tile a gene of interest with guide RNAs and therefore you can introduce high densities of these substitutions throughout the coding regions uh, in your protein, but also in this case throughout the whole interferon gamma pathway. Um, and, and essentially the, these operate by um, these deaminase domains basically being recruited to the cytidine or adenine um, which is proximal to the guide RNA protospacer. <clears throat> and um, just as a way of introduction, um, we generated some cell models in colorectal cancer cell lines, which have high activity of um, these A to G and C to T based editors. And as an example here is a reporter in not an endogenous gene, but here a, a transgene, in this case, blue fluorescent protein. And if we mutate this um, codon 66 histidine to tyrosine using a C to T transition, um, we can track the activity of the base editing in these, type, in these cell lines, which are doxycycline inducible. As you can see that there's um, GFP being produced from BFP um, over time there. Uh, and the same can be done with the adenine base editors. And in this way, we can track how active our cell lines are and, and um, is a good quality control. So we essentially we'll be doing this with uh, the endogenous genes now. 
So how do we do these screens um, to look at variant effects? Well, it's, it's very similar to a normal CRISPR-Cas9 screen, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, in fact, we started with CRISPR-Cas9 to look at the most important genes in these cataractal cancer cell lines um, as determinants to interferon gamma, and then use those to, uh, as a list to mutagenize with base editing. So in this case, we'd, um, we'd introduce our library of guide RNAs um, for the base editing, uh, tiling your genes of interest, and then the uh, actual bottlenecking step, the selection is actually to add interferon gamma in the tissue culture medium, and the cells normally die in response to interferon gamma. And then we can look for guide RNAs which are depleted, so sensitized to interferon gamma, or are enriched, so give resistance and might give resistance in the clinic as well. Um, and then <clears throat> with, with the base editing screens together with the Cas9 screens, we can really go from gene level, so that's the knockout with Cas9, um, down to a clinical variant of unknown significance using the base editing, which is actually introducing a single nucleotide change. And many of these single nuclear changes are actually more commonly found in cancers such as the C to T because of the apobec mutagenesis signature in many cancers. We actually use two different readouts in our screens. Um, one is a proliferation screen um, and one is a flow cytometry screen based on the gene expression of two cell surface markers, MHC class one and pd one and these are normally overexpressed in, uh, in response to interferon gamma. Okay, uh, and then finally, I'll just tell you a little bit about the, uh, the validation we did at the end. Um, essentially, we introduced the, the variants we found in the screen uh, into organoids, and then we could co-culture them with anti-tumor T cells to see if it really affects um, the, uh, the immunity, uh, the anti-tumor immunity um, in this system. Okay, so what do these data look like? Um, <clears throat> essentially, these are the genes that we, um, the top screening, sorry, the top hits from our CRISPR-Cas9 screen with interferon gamma. And then these are the, um, the plots showing the fax readout in the base editing screens versus the proliferation readout. Okay, so each dot is a guide RNA in, in one of these genes. And in color is the predicted consequence of the C to T or uh, C to T mutation in this case. So what we can see is actually that um, the proliferation and the fat screens correlate well um, in all of the genes uh, apart from this control gene beta two microglobulin, which is just a cell surface um, protein which is involved in antigen presentation. It's not involved in cell survival, so that shouldn't score in the proliferation screen. Most of the hits uh, were loss of function, so giving rise to resistance to interferon gamma, which is as expected. And there are a small number of um, gain of function mutations, which are mostly missense, uh, mostly in STAT1 and this negative regulator, SOCSS1. So some of the really interesting ones are these missense mutations, which cluster heavily with the stop codons and splice variants which we predict from the consequence of the guide RNA editing pattern. Uh, and these are really strong, as strong as the stop codons, really. So, so these are really strong loss of function mutations. <clears throat> the, the gain of function mutations are very interesting as well, and they've been actually found in hematological malignancies. So that gave us some um, faith in, the, in the, the, the clinical relevance of our data. And indeed, some of the uh, loss of function mutations have been found in patients which have failed to respond to cancer immunotherapies as well. So <clears throat> that was just with the um, C to T editing. Uh, and actually at this point, we wanted to increase the saturation of, um, of editing and to increase the number of variants that we could infer the function of. And, and that's when we added in the um, adenine base editors. So the, the, these are all of the um, different base editor architectures that we tried. We actually tried uh, an additional uh, cytidine base editor as well with the increased precision um, with, a, with a narrower editing window. Uh, and essentially when you add 
the A to G and C to T editors together, you can increase the number of mutations you can make, obviously. But also if you use PAM flexible editors, such as the NGN um, Cas9, um, which can bind to NGN instead of NGG PAMs, then you can, of course, increase the number of guides you can use and therefore increase the saturation of your base editing mutagenesis experiment. So really, if we um, use our most saturating editors for A to G and C to T, we can get to around 85% of non-synonymous amino acids changed uh, throughout the JAK1 protein, for example, that kinase in the jak stat pathway. And in terms of the number of codons that we can actually change with this combination of editors, um, with base editing, you can change all of the uh, naturally occurring amino acids to at least two other amino acids. So there's some redundancy there, um, which is useful if you want to change, for example, post-translational modifications, um, for example, you know, phosphocytes or ubiquitination sites. Also, you can introduce stop codons with the CTT editor, but not the A to G. So that's a, it's a useful advantage to add both of them together. So now I'm adding um, all of the mutagenesis data with all of the base editors we've used across one protein, uh, JAK1, this kinase, downstream of the interferon gamma receptor. And as you'd expect, then all of the, what you'd expect the loss of function mutations to be enriched. So they're above uh, with a positive Z-score and then the rarer gain of functions to be depleted. So that means that they're actually enhancing JAK1 function and causing the cells to die faster in the presence of interferon gamma than, than the control. Um, first thing to say is uh, there's actually good correlation between the base editors. So for example, we're having clusters of A to G and C to T editors, um, sorry, editing in some points, both causing gain of function. And these are coinciding on protein-protein interaction domains. We also picked up um, phosphocytes and ubiquitination sites, and also key domains as well, which I'll get to in a moment. So base editing can really pick, at well, this resolution, pick apart um, different functional domains and, and motifs in a functional protein. <clears throat> and again, um, we found certain missense mutations which had an unknown function which had been found in patients um, with cancer uh, and hematological malignancies as well. Um, also there were some mutations found in uh, immunological disorders um, which I won't get into uh, at the moment. <clears throat> so when we look at the predicted mechanism of action of some of these missense mutations which had previously unknown effects, um, we can look at the loss of function mutations in this partial crystal structure of JAK1. There's no full length crystal structure of JAK1 so far. So this kind of structure function information is quite useful. Um, you can see that the loss of function mutations in blue in the kinase domain are actually clustering, some of which are clustering around this, um, uh, sorry, the kinase active site which is coordinating these residues, magnesium and ATP. So obviously very catalytic residues, uh, strongly scoring loss of function, that makes sense. And also um, you can see here, sorry, I'll just uh, replay the video, that the gain of function mutations I mentioned are actually disrupting this known protein-protein interaction motif with SOCS-S1, this negative regulator of JAK1 that actually degrades it. And, and turns it off, um, switches off JAK1 protein levels as well. So we can detect protein-protein interactions. So we went about um, <clears throat> validating some of these hits from the signaling pathway, some of these variants of unknown significance uh, in JAK1 specifically, uh, quite deeply through several different mechanisms such as um, signaling, which I'm showing you here, so here's, here's the Z scores from, uh, of each of these guide RNAs, which we've now independently validated through an arrayed approach. Uh, and using base editing again, you can see that the proliferation uh, through a simple Geimser stain is actually very well correlated with the Z scores from the screen. 
So the loss of function uh, mutants are actually growing now in the presence of interferon gamma and the gain of function, not really. Uh, and also in terms of signaling, um, you can see that the gain of function mutations, these are these mutations which block the interaction with SOCS1, that negative regulator, they actually increase JAK1 levels and also increase signaling through the JAK stat pathway. Uh, in contrast to the loss of function mutations, which have the opposite effect. And some of these uh, missense mutations can actually be as strong functionally as a stop codon or a splice site mutant. Um, and some of these mutations are, are all kind of clinically uh, found in, in, in public databases, uh, for example, some of which uh, these patients uh, haven't responded to immunotherapy in the clinic as well. So it could have some translational relevance. <clears throat> in terms of um, the validation of the editing that we're, we're actually achieving, so most of the um, edits that we predicted from the guide RNA, um, the guide RNA editing window, so the C to T mutations from the, the protospacer, um, and to see how reliable that was, we wanted to do Ampicon sequencing to check whether we're getting editing that we expect or, or off-target editing or editing outside the window um, that we expect. And so um, this is uh, an array of around 24 different guide RNAs, which we had in our validation cohort. And you can see that uh, the editing efficiency is very high, so we're having around um, 40 to 50 percent editing on average and this is a triploid cell line by the way I should say so kind of quite challenging to get good editing rates and <clears throat> and also we can see that um, if we look at the four to nine position within the guide RNA uh, this is where all of the editing really in essence is focused so we can be quite certain um, that the editing is quite predictable um, with cytidine based editing there. So we're quite confident in our uh, predictions. And this is kind of an array of what you'd actually expect uh, with the actual genomic sequencing of the edit at the endogenous locus, okay? So we've done base editing plus and minus interferon gamma. And then we've, we've sequenced with Ampicon sequencing the endogenous locus to see what the actual effect is. Is it the same as what we predict from the guide RNA editing? pattern and, and indeed um, it's the case. So we see in red, you can hopefully see that in all cases, the loss of function mutations are enriched with interferon gamma, which is very good proof that these alleles are actually causing resistance, these missense mutations. And secondly, we can see that um, we are basically getting the, the mutations we expect, as well as some synonymous mutations as well, which are just caused by um, bystander C to T edits in this case. Okay, so it's quite comprehensive uh, kind of Ampicon sequencing to be definitive about the, um, the variants we've made. <clears throat> and then finally, I wanna show you um, a bit about the, the functional um, investigation or validation of these variants of unknown significance in the interferon gamma pathway in another model um, in a colorectal cancer organoid or a tumor organoid. So firstly, we wanted to check whether our editing, um, our screen in the interferon gamma pathway with base editing performed similarly in this tumor organoid than the cancer cell line we've used. So the cancer cell line here on, on the uh, y-axis and then the tumor organoid on the x-axis, we have very good correlation between the, for example, the loss of function and gain of function guide RNAs across the interferon gamma pathway, meaning that the variants have similar effects in both contexts, which give us confidence that um, this variant map is, is relevant in different cell models. But importantly, this allowed us to then use this tumor organoid, which is kind of special because we have matched autologous uh, anti-tumor T cells that we can use um, in co-culture assays to assess um, the level of immune evasion that these tumor organoids um, can have. So essentially in, in the normal wild type case, these tumor organoids are killed by the patient derived anti-tumor T cells. 
And then what we'd expect is that with the loss of function alleles, this could lead to immunoresistance or immunotherapy resistance and the gain of function alleles, we'd expect that they'd be more sensitive to um, anti-tumor T-cell attack. And essentially this is what we saw. We, we selected a, um, a few missense variants to validate in this co-culture assay to look at the effects of um, uh, immune evasion. And you can see that uh, the, the loss of function allele here, the, the organoids uh, in this co-culture are enriched versus the non-targeting control. And the gain of function, which is really exciting, is, is actually depleted. So if we can turn on the interferon gamma pathway more uh, with these gain of function variants, we can actually get more anti-tumor, um, or oh, sorry, we can get more uh, cancer killing by, by the immune system. And this is dependent on the, uh, on the MHC class one interaction with the T cells. <clears throat> and it's simply quantified below. So um, just to summarize, um, to summarize the talk here, just wrapping up, uh, basically we, we've mapped um, variants of unknown significance throughout the interferon gamma pathway using base editing screens um, and validation approaches in autologous tumor organoid systems and anti-tumor T cells. Um, <clears throat> we've also discovered mutations in, that are relevant for uh, in, sorry, hematological malignancies and um, immunological disorders, uh, which I haven't had time to go into today, but hopefully this kind of data will help um, genetic diagnoses and um, cancer variant interpretation. Um, most of the work was done on, on JAK1, but throughout the pathway as well, um, we've been expanding the number of proteins that we've been scanning using these approaches. Um, and finally, to, to kind of help to interpret the function of these variants and also to um, deploy them to the wider community, we developed a Shiny app to explore the data um, which is, uh, which will be available with the publication. Um, essentially, you can look at the different cell models we've used. You can look at the different um, screens we've used in terms of the base editor, in terms of the readout, proliferation of facts, and the different genes that we've tiled as well. And you can look at the protein uh, in terms of the amino acid position and then the variant you're interested in. You can change the annotation based on um, the predicted amino acid change uh, from base editing or a citation or, for example, um, a clinical association you're interested in, a ClinVar uh, phenotype. <clears throat> and you can search all of these as well um, in the search bar and download all the data as well. So I hope that will be useful for, for people moving forward. So that leads me to thank uh, Matthew Garnett and the whole lab, including uh, many collaborators. Uh, I'd like to highlight uh, the NKI for the um, autologous T cell system, and especially um, Andrew and the team, Open Targets, and the Wellcome Sanger Institute for funding. And thanks very much for listening and for the invitation. And I look forward to answering some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for this uh, very nice talk. And now uh, remember that you can uh, type your answers in the Q&A box. And uh, while we wait for the audience to type some questions, I might start with one. And uh, so you showed that uh, you had quite a few uh, uh, stop cotton mutations that were causing loss of function. And I was wondering uh, how frequent are they in patients? Like, uh, are they as frequent as missense mutations, for example? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So in patients, I think, yeah, I think the missense mutations are the most common, actually. Um, I, I, I did look on Cosmic database for Jack one for example, uh, the most common mutation is substitutions, you know, so CT is actually the most common or G2A. And the, the most common is missense mutations, simply because of the code on the table, so statistically. So it means that 
the majority of variants, we, we don't know what they do. Um, yeah, if, if there were stop codons, of course, we don't really need to do this type of experiment or splice, or splice um, variants as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, from the, um, from the um, uh, two base editors that you are showing, and you, of course, are missing some, some modern mutations. And can you somehow have an idea to know what the missing mutations would do? Like, and did you test for that? Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, the missing mutations, meaning that uh, it's not as good as saturation genome editing, basically. So, yeah, I mean, we know that for sure. Um, that's a big limitation. You can't make all of the amino acid substitutions. But um, one thing that we do have in, as an advantage is that, you know, you can scale this very easily and cheaply to, to many genes and you can look at whole proteins or pathways rather than domains in, you know, kind of facile way. But um, one thing I will say is that actually for some of the really key um, mutations with strong effects like protein protein interactions if you mutate the residue to any residue um not just you know not just one then then it has a very similar effect um so that's a context specific thing then that's also probably relevant for you know um drug binding or um yeah, especially protein protein interactions uh, so that's a very context dependent thing so in that case any of the other 19 amino acids will probably have a deleterious effect but there are some other scenarios where only one specific mutation will have a very deleterious effect and we don't capture those one thing that's kind of the opposite is that we found actually that in the adenine base editors you can make a proline substitution um, and that's actually almost always very deleterious because we think it actually makes the protein misfold okay so so obviously we wouldn't you don't see that the bigger picture with the other 19 different amino acids that's a great question thank you thank you and we have another question from asfar latif and uh, so it's uh, does the heterogeneity of mutations created by the uh, base editors between the two alleles uh, matter if so how do you account for that yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And um, we did think about that a lot, actually. So this is a triploid cell line. So um, we have to basically edit all three alleles. So the clinical data shows that in these patients which relapse on cancer immunotherapy, they have homozygous loss of function, okay? Not heterozygous because you still have one good copy that would operate. So you need to mutate all copies, uh, in this case, all three copies to get a loss of function phenotype. So actually just by um, inference, we think that we're getting homozygous editing in all of our loss of function alleles, not the gain of function probably. Um, and actually we, we've done, we've tested this now. Um, we've looked at the penetrance of editing and majority of our edits, edits are homozygous, um, but we do get some heterozygous edits as well, but I don't think those ones are the ones which are selected out. Great, uh, thank you. thanks a lot, Matt, again, and I think we can uh, wrap it up here. And um, thank you everyone, everybody for uh, attending today's seminar and uh, just as a reminder, we are taking a holiday on, uh, on July, so we will be back on, in August for the next uh, seminar series. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, and thank you, Matt. Thank you very much.